Today's video is about one of history's most interesting and pivotal yet controversial figures, Alexander the Great. By the end, you should be able to discuss who was Alexander the Great? Why was he important as in what were his long-lasting accomplishments? And be able to discuss was Alexander truly great? And now, to the history. So let's start with some background information. It's the year 404 BC. The once great Greek city-states such as Athens and Sparta have been falling apart at the seams. They've been fighting amongst each other in what was known as the Peloponnesian Wars. They were broke, they were downtrodden, and their civilizations were falling apart. The strength that they showed in fighting against Persia was gone, and now they were just uh, shells of their once former great selves. Now, Macedonia was a city-state, a region to the north of Greece that had viewed itself as Greek and had idealized the Greek form of life, but to the true Greeks, the Macedonians were viewed as second-class citizens, as wannabes, as uh, not better than slaves, but definitely not as good as the Athenians or the Spartans or the Corinthians or some of the other core city-states that made up what we consider to be Greece. By 360 BC, Macedonia was ruled over by a king named Philip II. Now, Philip II claimed that his family roots went back to be related to Hercules, who was the son of the Greek god Zeus. So once again, seeing the connection between a leader who claims a connection to the gods and saying that in his blood was the relation to the greatest of the Greek gods. Now, Philip II was not satisfied with just being some second-class uh, Greek offshoot area far up north. He wanted to control Greece, not just Greece, but he wanted to control all of Persia. And in his military conquest, he invented something called the Sarissa. The Sarissa is a 20-foot long pike. This gave him some distinct advantages in his day because people either used swords or really short spears. So, so these 20-foot pikes would allow him to be able to attack and his men to attack with the other people not being able to get anywhere near him. Plus, they didn't have to wear as much armor so that way they could move faster and have farther reach. This gave them many, many distinct advantages and they went on to crush all the local armies or most of the local armies within Greece. So Philip comes back from his rampage of Lower Greece. He is riding high, had just defeated these huge armies uh, with lesser men and had won great respect uh, from the Greek and the Greek world. Uh, and he came back to this wedding that was between uh, some different elements, some different parts of the Macedonian society. And while he was there, one of his bodyguards stabs him in the back and he dies. Now there's the question of who would take over after Philip II, as there were a number of parties within the Macedonians that wanted to rule. Now one of the people who felt that he should be next in line was Philip's the second son, Alexander. Alexander had been a general within Philip's army and had the great respect from many of Philip's men. But he had a problem. Alexander's mother was a foreigner. She wasn't Macedonian. Now, she did claim to come from the bloodline of the great uh, hero Achilles, but see, Philip had a second wife who was Macedonian and who had just recently borne him a son. So technically, Alexander was not the next in line for the throne. However, for Alexander, this would not be acceptable. He took his men, uh, rampaged basically all of the competitors in avenging his father's death, killed anyone that he thought might be related to it, and Alexander's mother killed the other woman and the other baby to make sure that there were no one who would be able to claim the throne other than her son. Now, Alexander... Uh, wanted to pick up where his father left off, and he began on the great conquest of Persia. 
Conquering Persia presented many issues for Alexander. As we can see from the map, Greece was little bitty tiny, and Persia was the largest physical empire on the face of the planet. It had the world's largest army, it was multi-ethnic, they had tons of money and resources, so the odds were stacked majorly against Alexander in his favor. However, Alexander the Great had the latest in military technology, and he was brilliant when it came to strategies. And in the first phase of his campaign, he conquers from Greece all the way down through Turkey to Egypt, where his ego gets blown up a little bit because uh, he already claimed to be related to Hercules, who was a son of Zeus, as well as Achilles, who was a uh, who was related to the gods as well. So. He already believed himself to be special and bordering on supernatural when he came across a priestess in Egypt who, when he walked in, essentially proclaimed him as being a god, and they crowned him as Pharaoh, which was basically saying he was a man who was a living god. Alexander let this go to his head a little bit too much, as we'll find out later. The second phase of his trip he went from Egypt and pushed all the way into Persia, chasing down King Darius in Iraq and Iran. He continued on through Afghanistan, which was a tribal area with uh, local warring factions that was always fighting amongst each other, which sounds a lot like today, and made his way eventually over to India. Now, this is important not just because he had conquered a long way, but to the Greeks, this was the edge of the map. The Indus River was the edge, and it was viewed that just beyond the Indus River, there'd be a huge ocean and the end of the world. So Alexander wanted to keep going. But the problem was it was monsoon season, and where there's endless, heavy, drenching rains, rains that are just pounding and pounding and pounding, and his men, who were thousands of miles of home, said, Alexander, enough. We need to do anything other than march. We want to go home. So they marched down the Indus River Valley, conquering every place that they came across. They came to the ocean and sailed their way back into the heart of Asia, what was once Persia, and there they rested and planned for their next venture. Problem was, what should they do next? Alexander didn't know whether to go back and try to keep pushing further into India. Should he go down and conquer into Africa? Should he go west and conquer Europe? Lots of options for a 32-year-old that had just conquered basically the better portion of the known world. Unfortunately for Alexander, at the age of 32, he dies. Some say it's from a disease, some say it was from too much drinking, some say he was poisoned. No one has really fully settled in on what would be the officially agreed upon answer. But upon his deathbed, he was asked, Alexander, who's going to take over after you? And his answer was the strongest. Problem was that for all of Alexander's greatness, on the battlefield, he was a horrible empire builder. Yes, he had spread the Greek language across the known world. He had built magnificent cities and had unified the Asians and uh, the Europeans in a way that had never been done before. But he has spent all his time conquering and destroying. He never set up a bureaucracy for how this massive empire was going to be run. He had set up no plans for succession of who was going to rule things after him, or who was even going to help rule while he was alive. So his quick, sudden, untimely death left a major power vacuum that no one person was able to fill. Indeed, almost overnight, his top three generals each claimed large chunks of the empire, and literally overnight, the empire collapses. The three pieces that remained, uh, lasted for hundreds of years, significantly longer than Alexander's empire while he was alive. So now let's discuss the greatness of Alexander. Yes, he conquered a 
massive amount of territory, but what really was his legacy? Because he was as much an important figure after his death as he was while he was alive. In the words of John Green, Alexander was a guy who conquered land for glory and heroism. He left behind a more closely connected society that could communicate and trade with more people more efficiently than ever before. He had spread the Greek language from Greece to the far-flung areas of India. Uh, he had brought people together and had built roads and pathways uh, that connected large swaths of area that got them trading and had a which had a very large, long-lasting, and lingering effect many centuries after he had died. Uh, he also set the bar as a general and as a warrior. He was a young man who had conquered great amounts of, great amounts of territory uh, at a very young age and gave this idea that youth and vigor was more important than age and wisdom. And he would become the standard, he'd become the bar for many great warriors and conquerors in the centuries to come. He also brought in a new twist to the idea of monarchy, that you have a man who was a king whose greatness was determined not by the quality of his rule, but by the amount of land and the size of the empire that he was able to conquer and rule. This became the standard for thousands of years to follow.